Hey fish and fam, today I'm going to show you how to get the very best and most useful images out of down imaging. This works all the same for Hummingbird Helix, Solix, and Apex. This video is going to be a little long, so I'm going to have chapters down below to help you skip along to the parts that you need and the parts that you may need to review again. Real quickly, I'm going to give you a rundown of what we're going to cover in this video. First, I'm going to define to you what I think the very best image is. I'm going to show you a picture or two of that. Second, I'm going to give you an overview of how down imaging works. Third, I want to give you some little things about your install that you need to make sure are right that'll greatly enhance your image quality. And lastly, I want to go over the seven controls that we have on Humminbird units to maximize our image quality and to make sure that we're getting the very best and most useful image out of our unit. So when I try to define what the best down image is, I want to think about what I can get out of that image and what I'm trying to achieve. And for me, it's two simple things. I want to know what's below the boat. I want to identify the different types of cover and I want to identify the different types of structure underneath the boat, whether it is either a brush pile or a tree or rocks, or if I'm trying to identify a ledge, a point, a flat, all that stuff, I want to be able to tell in this down image. On top of that, I also want to be able to tell if there's fish on it. That's the point of the fish finder. If you can't find the fish, there's no point in having a fish finder. So we want to be able to identify if there's fish on it and roughly identify what kind of fish on there are by their groupings and size. So if we can do those two things, the down image, in my opinion, will be the very best image. Now, on top of that, we don't want to miss any of that. We don't want to make it overly clear and the fish disappear and there's nothing there on the screen except for a nice, pretty structure. That's the kind of the pictures that Hummingbird likes to put on their website is perfect brush piles, laydowns. And I want to warn you guys, that isn't exactly real on what you're going to get. Some of those pictures are staged with a very fresh laydown. So it's got a hard return and in crystal clear water. So it doesn't exactly identify everyday fishing for you and I, but it doesn't mean that we can't make huge use out of down imaging. Now I wanna give you a quick overview on how down imaging works. Down imaging produces a thin, narrow beam going to the bottom of the lake. So this is a little slice and it is narrow going to the bottom of the lake. This beam uses higher frequencies than your normal 2D sonars, and this helps it produce more detailed images from harder items, and you tend to lose some of the softer items like fish or debris in, in the lake. So these won't return nearly as hard, and sometimes they're completely lost depending on the filters that you're using. These higher frequencies can be 400, 800, uh, 1000 or 1200 kilohertz. The uh, 1000 and 1200 we usually refer to as mega imaging and these provide the most clear and detailed images while losing quite a bit of those soft things. So you'll see the images that I produced today are made with those, but you can still see some fish. Now that we can visualize what the transducer is trying to capture below the boat, Let's take a moment and go over a few of the little things that we can do to make our image quality and the usefulness of our image even better. First, we need to make sure our transducer is firmly installed. When I bought, bought my boat, uh, it was actually loose, didn't know it, and my images looked kind of garbage-like. I couldn't get good quality images and I couldn't figure out why. I thought I had a bad transducer. Turned out it was just loose. Second, we need to make sure our transducer is even with the water column where the water level is this way and our transducer is parallel with it. We don't need it uh, aimed one way or the other. This is important mostly for GPS reasons. Say our boat's going this way and our transducer is aimed that way. That is going to cause images to arrive late of where the boat is positioned and is going to throw off our GPS waypoints. If we're marking waypoints from our down imaging, it is going to throw them off by several feet. 
Uh, deeper the water column is that you're trying to mark, the further off it's going to be. So I like to use the watermark on the side of my boat after fishing, measure the degree angle it is when my boat is parked, and making sure my transducer matches that angle perfectly. Therefore, they are the water level at the top and my transducer perfectly parallel every time. And most of us can do that with our simple handy dandy, handy dandy levels on our iPhones. So real easy to do that. Uh, just hey, kind of mark it with your phone and then repeat with your transducer. We also need to make sure our transducer is getting clean water. And what I mean by clean water is undisturbed water or minimally disturbed water. It doesn't need to be chopped up by a propeller of any kind. Uh, avoid rudders. Uh, you don't want to stir the water around it and cause a disturbance. This causes uh, a disturbance around the transducer and will give you returns much sooner than they actually are and it just looks like a bunch of noise. We also want to make sure our transducer is free of obstructions. Uh, a little less important on down imaging because it's usually pretty easy to have a straight shot downward. A little more important when you're doing side imaging things to make sure there's nothing to the side of your transducer causing uh, disruptions or getting in the way. Lastly, and probably one of the most forgotten about on the Humminbird Helix is to make sure that you have the correct transducer selected on your Humminbird unit. On Solex and Apex, it automatically can pick that up, but on Humminbird Helix, you have to pick out which one it is. If you're not sure, uh, on the little cable, there's usually a label uh, right where it plugs into your unit that tells you what kind of transducer that is. Uh, real easy to find and you can select it from your menu options. This will maximize the usefulness out of that transducer. If you have the wrong one selected, you could be missing some features or it could be trying to use it improperly. Now the part that everybody's been waiting for, we're gonna go over to my Humminbird unit and I'm going to show you the seven controls that we have at our disposal to give us the very best image. So let's head on over. Okay, so we are in front of my fish finder looking at a sonar recording that I have. I thought about taking this recording and applying it to my computer and using the filters on it to help you guys understand how to manipulate your image, but I felt like it was best to do it on the unit itself. So I'm sitting in here in the dark so I don't produce any extra glares and give you guys the best image. The first thing we want to talk about here is choosing a frequency. This one was recorded at mega frequencies, uh, but we have the option to change it. And I want you guys to remember the lower your frequency, we will see more soft items like fish, but you won't have nearly the detail on structure like we have here. If you want high detail structure, you need higher frequencies like the one I'm using now. Uh, I will give you guys kind of a quick preview. Uh, we can change this to 455 and I would have to increase the sensitivity to see the detail in this structure. Uh, 800 is kind of in between that. And then we can go to mega, uh, which provides the most detail. It's up to you to choose which frequency you want to use. Uh, my opinion is you should either stick between 800 and mega. And remember, if you need even more depth, if you're struggling on getting frequencies down to depth, uh, the lower the frequency, the more depth it can travel. So if you're looking for really large depths and not getting those returns at mega or 800, go to that 455 and it should serve you pretty well. Next, I wanna talk about depth or range as Humminbird describes it. And that is going to be describing uh, how deep we are looking in the water column. Right now we're set at this 30 feet. And that is because our unit is back at defaults on the range in auto. So as the image depth changes, it will 
automatically change the depth that you're looking at and screwing up the aspect ratio on everything you're looking at so you can no longer tell the size of things. So uh, right now I can easily tell that this brush pile is roughly about 10 foot tall, maybe eight foot tall or so. Uh, because it expands from 15 feet to a little over seven and a half feet. So it's between eight and 10 feet tall. But if my depth is always changing, that makes it even more diff difficult. So there are two different strategies I like to adopt and depending on the day, uh, the changes on my strategies. The first strategy is to set your range to whatever depth you plan on fishing for that day. That way you only see relevant data. So if you're only gonna fish up to 30 feet deep, set your lower range to 30 feet deep. The other strategy, and the one I adopt on lakes that are more similar, is to set my range for all of my lakes so that I never have to change my range. So if I have depths that I'm gonna fishing be fishing up to 60 foot deep, and the lake is 60 foot deep, and several of my other lakes are 60 foot deep. This keeps everything in proportion with one another. A brush pile from one part of the lake will look the same as another brush pile on the other side of the lake if they're the same size. One will look larger, one will look smaller if they're actually larger and smaller. It really helps your sense of scale and keeps you in a better mindset of how things are looking below your boat. Uh, and for this one, I'm just simply gonna probably leave it at 30 feet because that kind of makes sense for this lake and the size of items in this lake. Before we get into the two biggest settings for your fish finder, I wanna ask you guys to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy fishing electronic content like this. I'm gonna have a whole bunch more coming out. In fact, by the time you watch this, I may even have several in a playlist. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of that content. Next, we're gonna be talking about sensitivity. You probably already saw it on my screen. This tells the unit which returns to show as an image and which returns are just noise. We want to set this so that the items that we're interested in seeing below are well-defined and the hardest items like rocks and fresh brush piles should be some of the brightest in color. As you can tell in this image, uh, our brush pile is a little bit on the dull side. So if I was adjusting this image, and I will be right now, I would be increasing the sensitivity on this image so I would have a little more brightness to it. And I would probably set it probably around the seven, maybe an eight, uh, depending on how well the contrast complements it. And that's the next thing we're gonna talk about is contrast. This increases the definition of edges and returns in black spaces. So, in regard to this image, it's just going to cause more differences between the edge of this brush pile and the water column. Just a quick example there. Uh, this also reduces hazy noise in the water column. So if there's any pertinent information in the water column, like maybe a fish or two, uh, with high contrast, you will accidentally eliminate that information. So that's not what we wanna do. We wanna set this the contrast to complement the sensitivity and maximize this information so that we have just a little bit of haziness in the water column. This typically takes a little bit of back and forth uh, between sensitivity and contrast to get the best image. And in this regard, uh, this has too much contrast, so I am going to reduce the contrast a couple. Uh, you can't really see too much haziness being introduced in the image. I can see a little bit here, uh, but not enough that uh, I would call it good. I like to see a little more than that. And for you guys, it is becoming a little bit difficult. There we go. 
Uh, that's probably a little bit more than I would set it at in real life. I probably would have it set at maybe a seven here in real life because it still has haziness here, but you guys cannot see that due to the um, camera's ISO settings. So I'm gonna set it at a six uh, for your benefit. And you can see we're not missing a whole lot in the water column, but there is one thing that did pop up and that is this little fish that we could not see earlier. I'm gonna close this and kind of see if there's anything over here. Uh, maybe something there. But overall, I'm not seeing a whole lot of returns in the water column that represent fish other than this one. Now that I have my contrast set, I will play with my sensitivity a little bit more and kind of see if the image could use a little more brightness or if this is too bright. Um, and sometimes I'll go on the far extremes just to kind of see if anything changes in a positive attitude here. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of potentially improvements here, so I'll probably put it back at a number seven. Hey, by the way, if you guys have any questions about the stuff that I'm going over and I didn't touch base in detail enough for you, uh, make sure you let me know in the comments below. Ask me the questions. I get to all my comments. It may take me a couple days. And if you're lucky, I may even make a video on your questions. So be sure to leave me tons of questions down below and I'll try my best to help you out. So we have a few more settings to talk about. Uh, let's talk about sharpness. This is not something that I like to use because it really distorts the image as far as how the image looks. Uh, but sharpness specifically targets the boundaries between colors uh, on an image and makes them contrast more. Similar to what contrast does, but it does it even between different colors. So if you have a lighter color next to a brighter color, it will make that contrast even more. So we're going to turn it on and you kind of see how the image becomes a little pixelated on high. Uh, here's a medium setting um, and our brush pile kind of turned into a garbage mess here. You really can't see anything in it um, and there's low. So we're going to put it back on high and then I'm going to turn it back off. Uh, and I honestly prefer uh, sharpness off because I don't feel like it adds any value. It just provides more distortness to the image. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about sonar colors, but I ultimately prefer number three for down imaging. Uh, all the methods here for setting up your image works on all of these. Uh, you just have to find the sensitivity and contrast that work best for you. Uh, but the one thing that sticks out on this screen is dynamic contrast. Uh, and I have it on right now. If you turn it off, you can work with your image and define the contrast uh, in your settings here. So I can leave it off and I just have to work a little more with my contrast, meaning I have to turn it probably way up. Uh, five is probably a little much or four. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at chart speed guys. I'm sorry. Uh, eight's probably about perfect for me in this regard, or we can maybe play it a nine. I would probably leave it an eight without the dynamic contrast. Um, either way, um, Dynamic contrast is an automatic contrast for you and it does help you out on uh, setting your image. Uh, as you can see, things do become a little fuzzier without it around this brush pile. So I'm gonna turn it back on real quick for you guys so you guys get one more view uh, of it. It's under sonar colors. We're gonna turn it back on. And it does provide to me, a positive influence on our image. So I like to leave it on and I'm gonna put my contrast kind of back where I had it, I think around a five. 
Nope, I think I had it at a five or a six. Yeah. Either way, I think both options are good. I like to leave my dynamic contrast on. It's just an automated contrast, um, and it allows you to not have to put so much contrast in yourself. Uh, the last thing, and probably a really important thing, and I wanted to talk about it last because it takes a little longer for me to do, and that is chart speed. This image was recorded at a chart speed of five, uh, and you want to marry this uh, with your boat idle speed. Um, if you don't have the right speed, it will distort your brush pile to be either really long or really skinny. Um, the really long is if you have your chart speed set too fast, and it will be really skinny if you have your chart speed set too slow. Um, that means it's just not matched up very well. So my idle speed for my boat is around 3.6, 3.7 miles per hour. And I either use a three, not a three, I either use a four or a five, uh, kind of depending on the wind direction and how fast I'm actually able to scan. If I'm closer to four miles per hour, I'll use a, a five on my chart speed. And today I used a five. And you can see that my image is uh, actually pretty proportionate. I probably could have sped it up a little bit more, but that's just my opinion. Now I'm gonna go rewind this. You see this image here. I'm going to rewind it and replay it at a chart speed of eight. And then I'm also gonna redo it at a chart speed of two. So we're gonna take three minus and three plus, and I'm gonna show you this image again. So here we are recording at a chart speed of about eight. Actually, it's exactly eight. And you can see my GPS speed was actually pretty slow. I must've been going into a headwind. It looks like we're going 2.7, uh, 2.9 miles per hour. So an eight's probably way too fast. I kind of take that back. This image actually looks a little better, honestly, in my opinion. Uh, as you see the brush pile come along, I will take a still image and let you guys kind of see the difference between the three. Uh, the first one was done at a five. This one is an eight. So now I'm gonna rewind it and do this one more time. So here we are with our brush pile, uh, the exact same one and played back at a chart speed of two. You can kind of see how it becomes a long skinny mess uh, and that's because the chart speed is too slow. In fact, if I had to redo this image, I probably would do it at a uh, chart speed of eight. Uh, seemed to produce a very, actually a very good image yeah, that I liked. So you'll have to experiment with your setup, find some cover that you kind of know what it looks like. Maybe set you a, a Christmas tree in there in a lake somewhere. Hey, people set brush piles all the time. Just make sure it's legal where you're doing. Um, and run over that brush pile, uh, Christmas tree, whatever you set several times and kind of see what it takes to get the right chart speed so you portray that image. I mean, this actually, you can't really tell much of what's going on. Um, and that's kind of what happens if you set your chart speed incorrectly. I'm gonna speed this guy back up and it looks like I should have been playing around at an eight anyways. That's kind of news to me. I uh, didn't realize that my chart speed was too slow. So you are going to have to make minor tweaks and adjustments to your fish finder every time you go out to the lake. Every boat, every fish finder, every transducer, every lake cover is different. Even different areas of the same lake, you're gonna have to make minor tweaks and adjustments. Now I prefer to adjust sensitivity first and then go after contrast and then go after sensitivity again to see if I can tweak the image to make it crisp. What I find out more often than not is a lot of the brush piles and cover that I like to fish are traditionally really, really old, maybe 10 plus years. 
in the making. So since it's so waterlogged, it doesn't give off that good of returns. So I do the best I can with what I get. There are a lot of other things that do affect your transducer's performance, such as water clarity, time of year, water temperature, debris in the water, algae blooms. Um, even if you have a lot of grass on your lake, that does affect the, your returns as well. So just know that there's not one set of settings that works perfectly year round or perfectly all the time. You're gonna have to make some adjustments. So if you would do me a favor, if you enjoyed or learned anything from this video, leave me a like. I hope this video helped many of you out. If you like learning about fishing electronics, I have a playlist of them here. I also have a playlist of things about hummingbird solix. I'm gonna do a series on that as well. I'm gonna list that playlist up there. But just like always, thank you guys so much for watching and see you later, fishing fam.